Now we're finally ready to move on to magnetism. An introduction to magnetism first involves an introduction to the magnetic field. It turns out we'll be able to draw a lot of comparisons between the magnetic field and the electric field, and that's good news because we're now masters of the electric field. But let's discuss the electric field again for just a sec. How did we define the electric field? The electric field is just the electric force vector that a small positive test charge would feel at some point, divided by the charge itself. You might remember I said something like, we couldn't understand the wisdom behind defining the electric field, but you just had to trust me. We're not yet in a position where we can understand the wisdom behind defining this new concept. This new concept being the electric field. Well, it turned out I was right. Defining the electric field then didn't make any sense in the moment because we were just adding more technical jargon to our toolkit. It just didn't make any sense why we would want to do that. Why define an electric field when we already knew how to work with electric force just as well? Why not just leave it at that? Well, we discovered later that defining an electric field gave us the ability to understand a huge variety of phenomena, like the behavior of capacitors, the behavior of individual electric dipoles, the behavior of dielectrics, and the behavior of resistors, all in the context of real-world circuit problems, too. So defining the electric field actually ended up being hugely beneficial, even though we couldn't see it at the time. Now, where do electric fields come from? In the lowest common denominator, all electric fields are the result of electric charge. Electric charges that exist in space create electric fields in space, as we saw, and those electric fields can result in forces on other charges. When we were dealing with electric fields, the first thing we did was identify where the electric field came from. It just comes from individual electric charges. And then we defined how do charges behave in the presence of electric fields. And that second question was basically everything else we went over. That general model we used to learn about the electric field, first, where does it come from? Second, what does it do? We seem to be pretty successful with that model, so we're going to try applying the same model to the magnetic field and see what happens. Our first question then is, where do magnetic fields come from? Now, make no mistake, this is actually a pretty easy question to answer. With electric fields, we saw that electric fields could be created by electric charges, whether those charges were just standing still or whether they were moving. In either case, electric fields exist in space. But the magnetic field works a bit differently. Our first takeaway is that magnetic fields can only be generated by moving charges. We're going to need to move into three dimensions if we want to see the magnetic field. When we have charges standing still, there is no magnetic field. When we have moving charges, however, those moving charges create magnetic fields. That, in a nutshell, is where magnetic fields come from. How do we quantify this, though? Imagine we have a single charge Q moving through space with some velocity vector V. If we want the instantaneous magnetic field at some point P in 3D space, at the very least we're going to need Q, V, and the position vector from the charge to point P. That'll give us enough information to find at least a first order approximation of the magnetic field vector B due to a charge like this. It's just an approximation. Technically, it's not correct for multiple reasons, but we'll just assume it is for now. The magnetic field vector is given by mu naught q times v cross r all over 4 pi r cubed. Oh boy, there's a lot of stuff going on there, so let's break it down. But first, some historical background. This is based off of a more complicated and correct formula known as the Biot-Savart law, named after the physicists Jean-Baptiste Biot and Felix Savart. We'll go over the Biot-Savart law in a lot of detail in the next module. Now, why B for the magnetic field? We had E for the electric field, which makes sense, so why not call it, say, M for magnetic field? Apparently, James Clerk Maxwell chose the symbol for magnetic field as B because he was just creating symbols for the variables he was using in alphabetical order. Well, over time, the B just kind of stuck, the same way current being positive charge flow kind of stuck even though we now know currents are normally generated by moving electrons, which are negatively charged. So we'll always use the symbol B for the magnetic field then. Now what is this mu naught here in the equation? Mu naught is a fundamental constant of nature called the permeability of free space, not to be confused with the permittivity of free space, which we called epsilon naught. Mu naught just has an exact value of 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th tesla meter per ampere. 
Now, what's a Tesla? Tesla actually just ends up being the unit for magnetic field. And all the other variables are pretty much what you would expect. Q is the charge, V is the velocity vector, the bold R with the arrow on top is the actual position vector, and the italicized non-bolded R is just the magnitude of the position vector. I leave it as an exercise for you to show that taking all these variables together, you end up with units of Tesla for the magnetic field. So that was a lot of mumbo jumbo, but let's actually see this equation in action. What does it look like? The simplest moving scenario we can create is just a charged particle moving with constant velocity. Ironically, the magnetic field lines that result are not simple at all. The magnetic field itself is a cross product, so if the direction of B is determined by the direction of V cross R, all we have to do is use the right hand rule. So point our fingers in the direction of V and curl our fingers in the direction of R and our extended thumb points in the direction of B. The direction of B is such that it's always perpendicular to both the position vector from the charge to the point and the velocity vector of the charge. If we know the direction, all we need is the magnitude, and the magnitude of V cross R we know is VR sine theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity vector and the position vector. Then we note that one of the R's will cancel, and the magnitude of the magnetic field the distance R away from the point charge is given by mu naught Q over 4 pi R squared, all times V sine theta. Therefore, we know the direction of the magnetic field by the right hand rule, and we know the magnitude as well. So if we know the direction and we know the magnitude, that's complete information about the vector itself. And with that mathematical jargon out of the way, this is where things get really beautiful. You see, we don't have to focus on just one point. Computer simulations allow us to see what's happening at as many points as we want. So let's trace a cylindrical shape around the velocity vector line and see how the magnetic field behaves. We see the magnetic field creates these circular vector paths around the moving charge like this. The magnetic field is always perpendicular to the charge's velocity, as we would expect from the cross product. When a point is closer to the moving charge, the magnetic field is stronger, which we would also expect since we're dealing with a 1 over r squared dependence in terms of the magnitude like we saw before. How extraordinary. Now that's just for a single electric charge. If we have a collection of moving charges, all we have to do is, for each point in space, add up the magnetic field contribution due to each individual charge, and the sum of all those little magnetic fields creates a net magnetic field at the point. This is called superposition, and we saw superposition at play when we were dealing with the electric field due to many point charges. You just add up all the electric field vectors, either using the tip-to-tail method if that's convenient, or adding them numerically. So with that out of the way, we can extend this animation to include multiple point charges moving along the same line with constant velocity, and we see that we end up with a little more stability in the magnetic field vector surrounding the moving charges. If we keep on increasing the number of charges per unit length, we get a more and more stable magnetic field distribution around the point charges. And in the limit as the number of charges becomes very large, we end up with pure electric current, this is the same kind of current that we would see in a current carrying wire like in the DC circuits module. We have to scale down the field vectors here because otherwise they'll be too large. But now this is something truly amazing. When we have pure steady electric current, the magnetic field vectors stop wiggling around. At each point in space, the magnetic field stays constant around a long wire carrying steady current. We see the magnetic field is still tracing out concentric circles but the field vectors themselves aren't changing over time, even though the individual positions of all the charges are changing. How remarkable. It's honestly pretty incredible that we were able to go from this one seemingly not so special equation to a conclusion so profound, and actually this is just the beginning, but you're gonna have to wait for the rest. In part two of our magnetic field series, we'll explore the question, where do magnetic fields come from in a lot more detail, but until then, this should at least whet your appetite for now. For the rest of part one, we'll be focusing on the consequences of the magnetic field, namely, assuming we know where magnetic fields come from, which we do, we know they come from moving charges, what are the consequences of those magnetic fields, meaning how do external magnetic fields affect other charges? We saw how electric fields were created by charges, and those fields could then affect the behavior of other charges. And we got a very similar deal with the magnetic field. Magnetic fields are created by moving charges, and those fields affect the behavior of other moving charges. 
And with that, we begin our exploration of the magnetic field.